Would you open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter 2? While you're turning there, I want to talk about Christmas gifts a little bit with you. When you pick out Christmas gifts for someone that you love, you want it to be meaningful. We all want it to be meaningful because we want that gift to be an expression of our love, our affection, our appreciation for the people that we're giving it to. And we want them to know we appreciate them, not just on December 25th. And so we want to give gifts that last. Maybe it's a special sweater. Every time they put on that sweater, they think of the relationship you have with them. But where can you find those gifts? And once you find them, how do you let others know, hey, you can go to this place to find great gifts that keep on giving? And so I did some research for you. And I tapped into the cultural pulse of our times. I've read a BuzzFeed article for you entitled, catch this, 48 products that are the epitome of gifts that keep on giving. Now, that's a big promise. They are the epitome of gifts that keep on giving. So I had to read it, and after reading it, had to share it with you. So I'm not going to read you the article, nor all 48 products, but I am going to bring three to your attention in case you're not done shopping. The first one, gift that epitomizes the gifts that keep on giving, is a carrot-shaped water releaser. <laughs> Picture this with me. It's a plastic carrot that you fill with water and you, you insert it into the soil of your potted plants to release you from the unreasonable burden of watering your own house plants. The second gift that I'm sharing with you is a pasta tower, a Tupperware-looking clear plastic case. Now, we have finally, folks, come across the answer for the problem of the skinny, easy-to-open cardboard box that previously persecuted you when you were cooking Italian. Now, here... Remember, this is the list that epitomizes gifts that keep on giving. How the pasta tower made it, I'll never know. But this one, this one makes sense. It is an elephant organizer. I kid you not. Come up to me after the service. I will give you the hyperlink to this list. Now, contrary to popular opinion, the, the elephant organizer is not something that helps you organize your elephants. No. No, this, it's a, you got to picture this. It's a ceramic holder that sits on the corner of your sink. And you put your sponge in it or silverware in it, and it helpfully drains the water through a trunk that goes into the sink. Somebody's going to have to explain to me how these gifts keep on giving or epitomize keep on giving and there are 45 more of them on this list. And yes, in my sermon prep out of love, I read the whole article. <laughs> every gift, every product, every purchase that we make, every item has limits on the joy it will provide you and the love that it conveys, even the elephant organizer. There are limits on these gifts, and none of these gifts epitomize a gift that keeps on giving. I want you to enjoy the gifts you get. I'm not trying to take the joy out of Christmas. Enjoy the gifts you get, and especially enjoy the gifts you give, but do so knowing that true joy is not going to come wrapped in a box, and it's not going to be stuffed in stockings. As Christians, while we come to Christmas this year, as we come to this Sunday, and as we come to this text, we're going to find gifts that epitomize gifts that keep on giving. What we're going to find behind this one verse we're going to focus on today is a Savior who is a gift giving Savior. 
And so for you note takers, the title of this message is Christ has come, the giving Savior. We're going to read verses 21 through 25 just like Jared did last week, but we will focus particularly today just on verse 24. But let's, let's look together at 1 Peter 2, beginning in verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." Let's pray. Father, as we come to your word, particularly as we come to verse 24 and your sacrifice on our behalf, Lord, would you open ears, soften hearts, and by your spirit speak loudly to our souls that we would hear of the good gifts that you've given to us. Lord, do it because you love your glory do it because you love your people. In Jesus' name, amen. Each verse in, I'm sorry, each phrase in verse 24 contains a gift that comes to us that keeps on giving. And this Christmas, if you know Christ as your Savior, if you sit here knowing you are born again, these gifts are yours today. They will be yours tomorrow. But if you've come and you don't know Christ as your Savior, let me tell you, these gifts can be yours today. Today, we don't need to wait till Christmas. They can be yours today. And here they are. There's three of them since there's three phrases in this verse. Payment for sin's punishment, freedom from sin's dominion, and healing from sin's ultimate sickness. So let's take those one at a time. Number one, payment for sin's punishment. Take a look at the beginning of verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. And we're going to break this down because each of these words has, has a deep amount of significance. First is the word he. That points back to Jared's message. Last week, it points back to the character of Christ, the nature of Christ, the sinlessness of Christ, the wonderful suffering servant that, that Peter is pointing us to and that he teaches us about in the verses prior. But Jesus, being this wonderful Savior, did not simply send someone to save us. The verse says he himself saved us. The former superintendent of our schools had a discipline of attending every concert he could by himself. He went himself. He didn't send someone from his office. He himself showed up at the fifth grade chorus concert, at the seventh grade orchestra concert. He went, and that meant a great deal of support for the kids and the parents alike, appreciated the way that expressed support. Now take that illustration, multiply it, infinitely, and what we have here is a God who so loved us that he himself came to deal with the penalty of sin. He didn't send someone, which of course would have been enough, would have been fine with us. He sent himself. What does it say next? He himself bore our sins. And that word bore matters. We're going to focus on it. Now, certainly, 
It has definition, right? It means that he carried or came under our sin. But just as importantly, the word bore is past tense. It's done. The work is finished. There's no more bearing Jesus has to do. He bore our sins. You see, that's the next word after bore. He himself bore our sins. And that includes Peter. The first person plural there. That includes Peter. It includes his original readers. It includes me. And it includes you. Now remember Peter. Don't just think of him as the author of this letter. Think of him as a character in the Gospels. When Peter reflects on the fact that his sins have been borne by Christ himself, he knows it includes his big sins and his small ones. Peter denied Christ at the moment Christ was most vulnerable. Peter was rebuked in Galatians for his ethnic favoritism, and yet after all of that, Peter wrote this phrase, Jesus himself bore our sins. And friends, this is good news for us today because it includes your sins. It includes your biggest failures, your deepest regrets, your most shameful acts. He himself bore our sins, includes the sins everyone knows about and the sins no one knows about. When you come to Jesus, he passed tense, bore your sins. When you confess those sins to him, he's faithful and he's just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And let me summarize it. There is an answer. There's a way forward for your biggest regrets to be lifted from you. You don't have to live buried by them. Your biggest failures don't define you when you come to Jesus. He bears them for you. He defines you when you come to Jesus. This payment for sin's punishment is a gift that keeps on giving. Every moment and every day, it is truth that sets you free. Now, in order for Jesus to do this, he had to bear the penalty of our sins in his body on the tree. Isaiah 53 is what Peter has in view in this verse. Take a look just at verses 4 and 5 from Isaiah 53. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. You want a gift that keeps on giving? Here's one. Peace with God. Peace with God is a gift today, and it will be a gift Tomorrow, because he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, we have peace with God. We have finally reached something that epitomizes a gift that keeps on giving. This is the only solution. It's the only solution for the problem of sin. Now, perhaps, Perhaps this is your first time here. Maybe you were at the concert last night. You thought you'd try out coming to service. We are thrilled that you are here. Thrilled you're here. And maybe you thought we, you could just come and, you know, enjoy some Christmas carols during the season. I certainly hope you did that. But God has bigger plans for you than that. He has more to give you today 
than sentiment through Christmas carols. He wants to give you the gift of the solution to the problem of your sin. He wants to lift the penalty of sin from you. If what I've said represents you, just take a look around the room. This room is full of people who at one point sat under the penalty of their sins. They were sitting under judgment. When they came to Christ, he lifted that punishment. He bore their sins. And so we're not better than you. We're not smarter than you. We are just like you. We just know Christ as Savior. And we want that for you today. He wants that for you today. Now, how do you do that? You don't unwrap this gift the way you unwrap gifts on Christmas Day. You unwrap it through confession and repentance. You agree with God that you are a sinner in need of a Savior. And then you repent of your sins. You turn away from them to Jesus, the Savior, for forgiveness. After the service, talk to the person who brought you. Come talk to one of the pastors or just grab a nearby stranger who looks friendly enough to talk to you and tell them that you gave your life to Christ or you want to. They would, every person here would be thrilled to pray with you and to do that for you. But there's more in this little verse, verse 24. So there's more gifts I want to tell you about. Let's jump into the second one. Freedom from sin's dominion. Look at the next phrase in verse 24. He says, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. There's a reason, folks, that Jesus bore our sins in his body on the tree. And Peter gives it to us here. Here's the reason, the so that. It points back to the previous phrase. He bore our sins in his body on a tree. Why? So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. When we die to sin, we die to its control over us. We die to its penalty, and yet in an ongoing way, we're dying to its influence. In the past, before you come to Christ, we lived for self for shallow happiness, for financial gain, for prestige, for the honor of our own name. We lived defensive lives. We lived self-promoting lives. We lived for things that were perishing and would not last. In a phrase, we lived for sin. But because of Jesus, we are now free from that. We are free from that dominion, free to live for righteousness, for the pleasure of our creator instead of our own pleasure. And in Romans 6, Paul expounds upon this. Let's take a look, beginning in verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that, oh, there's the so that again. We would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. When we come to Christ, we are so closely united with him. His death is our death. His life becomes our life. And death and sin, therefore, have no dominion over Christ, and they have no dominion over us. We are free. We are free to live as God has designed us to live. And Nancy DeMoss Wolgamuth comments on it this way. She says, 
God's goal in saving you was not just to make your few years on planet Earth easier or more enjoyable. He had an eternal end in view. His intent was to make you holy as he is holy, that you might perfectly glorify him, that you might bring him pleasure, and that you might enjoy intimate fellowship with him for all eternity. Freedom from sin's dominion. What a gift. It means we are not governed any longer by what governs the hearts of this world. We have a hope and a future that's beyond this world. Our citizenship and our treasure belong somewhere else. This world can't touch it. So we are free from the control sin seeks to exert. And in essence, when sin's dominion is broken, we are free not to sin. We're not just freed from it, we are free not to. And let me illustrate it this way. Perhaps in your life you've dealt with sinful anger. Your response to not getting your own way is to explode on whoever or whatever is in your way. Your kids, your spouse, your dog, other drivers on the road, maybe a wall. When your own convenience is your God, then explosive anger makes sense. In order to serve the God of convenience, you must make others serve the God of your convenience as well. And if they won't willingly do it, we'll get them to do it by force. But then you meet Jesus. He becomes your object of worship, not your convenience. He becomes your controlling influence, not yourself. Any inconvenience you face is found within the goodness of his providence. Every sin that's committed against you is found within the goodness of his sovereignty. There is a greater God than the God of convenience, and there is a greater truth than the truth the God of convenience preaches. Jesus is more important than we are, and we delight to live like Jesus is more important than we are. So now... With that major paradigm shift, now you're not only freed from the God of convenience, but with the power of Christ at the helm, you are free to serve God when, convenience, when inconveniences occur. You don't need to explode in anger. Other choices become available. Choices God calls us to, like patience, overlooking, forbearing, covering over, your anger is no longer your go-to response. Why? Because you've been freed from it. And you've been freed not to do it. Edwin Blum says this succinctly. He says, by means of Christ's death on the cross, whoever comes to him ends his old life and begins a new one devoted to righteousness. So we are freed from sin's penalty and we are freed from sin's power. Surely that would be enough, wouldn't it? Well, there's more he gives us in verse 24. So let's go to the third gift. Healing from sin's ultimate sickness. Look at the rest of verse 24. It says, by his wounds you have been healed. Earlier, we looked at Isaiah 53 briefly. I left out a phrase. Some of you were probably saying, hey, Rob, you left out a phrase. I'm, I'm going to put it back in now. All of verse 5 reads this way. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds, we are healed. 
Is there any doubt Peter has this in mind in writing 1 Peter 2.24? To a suffering people, to help them suffer well, he reminds them all that there's another who suffered well, and he suffered for them. He suffered for us. The ultimate sickness that sin holds over every soul is eternal death. God promised it to Adam and Eve that when they ate of the fruit, they would surely die. And that sickness carries through to every one of Adam's descendants. But through the wounds of Jesus, we are healed from the ultimate sickness sin inflicts upon us. No matter what, the world throws at us, no matter the devices of the evil one, even if we should suffer like Job, listen to this gift that keeps on giving, nothing can take away the victory of the cross over sin and death. Nothing. I don't know what you're facing, but I know it can't take this away. 1 Corinthians mocks death in chapter 15. He says, Paul says, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And let's pause there. Folks, we should be thanking God every day. Every day for the gifts of salvation, from lifting sin's punishment. We should wake every morning with applause in our hands, praise on our lips. And even with all the applause, and even with all the praise, there's more. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians 15 to point out the impact that this work of, of Christ should have in our lives. The impact it should have in our hearts is sustaining hope. Look at what he says in verse 58. I think we're going to put that on the screens. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Our healing from sin's ultimate sickness sustains us through hardships. It sustains us through discouragements, through rejections, through betrayals, through disappointments, through heartache. Why? Because our eternity is secure. No matter what happens today and no matter what happens tomorrow, we know what the future holds. And with our eyes fixed there, you can bump us, but you can't crush us. You can discourage us, but you cannot defeat us. Because that's where we're headed. And with our hope focused there, we are immovable. And we can be sustained in Christ. Because of that, it is possible, it's more than possible, it is God's call to every believer to be ever steadfast and immovable. He calls us to be steadfast because we've been healed from the ultimate sickness of sin. We've been saved from the penalty of our sins. We've been delivered by his wounds from eternal death and taken to eternal life. And so the Christmas carol rings out saying, No more let sins and sorrows grow, nor thorns infest the ground. He comes, he comes to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. That's, he's come to spread his blessing and to turn sin and death on its head. John Newton 
everything he writes is beautiful, but he captures this beautifully. He says, blessed be God. Amidst so many causes of mourning in myself, it is still my duty and my privilege to rejoice in the Lord. In him, I have righteousness and strength, pardon and peace. I have sinned. I sin continually. But Christ has died and forever lives as my redeemer, priest, advocate, and king. And though my transgressions and my enemies are very many and very prevalent, the Lord in whom I trust is more and mightier than all that is against me. Do you have that kind of confidence in Christ? Friend, he is worthy of it. He is worthy of that kind of confidence. You may be staring a great giant in front of you. You may be facing a foe that has beaten you much in the past. But the Lord in whom you trust is more and mightier than that. Let me encourage you, church, this Christmas season. Look back and see sin's punishment lifted from you. With deep appreciation, praise God. Look forward and see sin's ultimate sickness healed. Your eternal security is sealed in the blood of Jesus. And then you look right now at your fight with sin. You stare it in the eye and say, your dominion is broken over me. I don't have to obey you. I am free from your control and I am free to honor God. And then you know what there's left for us to do? Just worship. Worship with gratitude. Worship like you've never worshiped before. Rejoice. Rejoice. Emmanuel has come. These are gifts that keep on giving. These are tidings of great joy. This is why there can be joy to the world. Why? Because the Lord has come. Now, let covenant fellowship, let all the earth receive her king. Amen? Amen. Merry Christmas.